Next on KNX, Gentleman's Agreement with Gregory Peck and Ann Baxter, presented by Radio Theater. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gregory Peck and Ann Baxter in Gentleman's Agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When I saw the preview of Daryl F. Zanuck's magnificent production of Gentleman's Agreement, I marked it down as a must for the Lux Radio Theater. Based on the exciting novel by Laura Hobson, the Daryl F. Zanuck film won three Academy Awards, including Hollywood's highest honor, the Academy Award for the Best Picture of the Year. Tonight in Gentleman's Agreement, Gregory Peck repeats the finely sensitive performance he gave on the screen. And co-starred with him is one of our favorites, Anne Baxter. Many of you have asked for this play in your letters. And in the mail the other morning with some of these requests was a clipping from a current magazine. It told of what one American missed most in a foreign land. His mother's apple pie, hot dogs, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the Lux Radio Theater. Well, it's flattering to be considered a symbol of the American way of life. But it's the welcome you have given Lux Flakes in your home that has made this theater possible. And these days, along with baseball in Brooklyn or apple pie for breakfast in New England, the Lux Radio Theater is a fixture in the living room as Lux Flakes are in the kitchen. It's curtain time for Gentlemen's Agreement, and here's the first act, starring Gregory Peck as Phil and Ann Baxter as Kathy. New York City, headquarters of the celebrated magazine Smith's Weekly. In the editor's office, John Minervy has welcomed an old friend. Now tell me, Phil. Finding your way around town? Oh, almost. Good. Mother and kid like New York, huh? Oh, they like the apartment, too, thanks. And a bit of luck. Probably the last apartment in Manhattan. How is your mother, Phil? And the boy? Oh, they're both fine, Mr. Minifee. Uh, the boy. Uh, does he miss his mother? Well, Tom is ten now, Mr. Minifee. It's six years since Helen died. I don't think he remembers her too well. Well, now, what about tonight? You didn't give me an answer. Oh, thanks. Some other time, maybe. Nonsense. I won't ask you another time. Just a few friends coming over. <laughs> I thought you brought me to New York to do some writing. Yes, I brought you here to do some writing. Now get good and comfortable, because I'm going to talk to you about it for about an hour, maybe two hours. Phil, I've had an idea. An idea that's likely to stand this country right on its self-righteous ear. I hate introducing people. Anyway, Phil, I've saved the best for the last. Kathy, this is Mr. Green, my niece, Miss Lacey. Hello. How do you do? Sit down, Mr. Green. Yes, sit down. I'll bring you a cocktail. Well, Mr. Green, I haven't read everything you've written, but what I have has been, well, exciting. Exciting and honest. Well, thanks. Do you mind telling people what you're writing now? Let me tell her. I've asked Phil to do a series on anti-Semitism. Break it wide open. Been wanting to do it for some time. Oh, do I get a credit line? You? Oh, don't you remember? I was the one who suggested Why, it. Why, sure. I knew somebody was after me, but I forgot who. Here's your drink. I'm always stealing ideas without knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, Miss Lacey. You suggesting the series. Is it? Why? Oh, lots of reasons. You make up your mind too quickly, Mr. Green. About women, anyway. I saw you do it as soon as you sat down. Is that apparent, huh? Oh, let's see. I'm a little too well-bred, artificial, a trifle absurd. Typical New York. Well? Oh, I didn't have time for all that. Oh, yes, you did. I even left out a few things, such as... All right, I give up, Miss Lacey. You win. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll tell you some more. I'm divorced. I work. I help run a nursery school. Mm -hmm. What else? You want just anything? Just anything. Well, I'm supposed Dinner. to be... 
Hey, Phil, dinner. Oh, come along, Mr. Green. Well, Phil, have a nice time at the Minifees last night? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, Mom, very nice. Tommy, you'll be late for school. Pop, what are you going to write about this time? Well, Mr. Minifee wants me to do a series on anti-Semitism. Oh, you don't sound very enthusiastic. Well, I'm not. What's anti-Semitism? Well, it's, it's when some people don't like other people because they're Jews. Why? Are they bad? Well, some are, sure. Some aren't, it's like everybody else. But why don't some people like Jews? Well, some people hate Catholics and some hate Jews. And no one hates us because we're Americans. Well, no. No, that's, just, that's something else again. You see, one thing is your country, like America or France or Germany or Russia. But the other thing is religion, like the Jewish or the Catholic or the Protestant religion, see? Religion hasn't anything to do with the country. You get it? Uh-huh. Well, see you tonight, Pop. Bye, Grandma. Whew. That kid's gonna wreck me yet. Phil, about the assignment. You're disappointed? Oh, yes, I am. I wanted to work on something I'd know people would read. You mean there's enough anti-Semitism in real life without people reading oh, about no, it? Oh, no, but what can I say that hasn't been said before? Maybe it hasn't been said well enough. If it had, you wouldn't have had to try to explain it to Tommy just now. It would be nice sometimes not to have to explain it to kids. Kids are so decent to start with. Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice. I'm surprised, Phil, happily surprised. I thought you were going to refuse the assignment. What changed your mind? Oh, a couple of things, Mr. Minifee. I may put my niece under contract, inspiration department. <laughs> no, it wasn't Kathy. It was my kid. I tried to explain it to him this morning. It was kind of tough. Anyway, I want to do the series very much. I'll need your research department, facts and figures. Now, wait a minute. I don't want facts and figures. I don't need you for that. Phil, use your head. I want an angle, some dramatic device to humanize it, to get it read. Yeah, you don't want much, you just want the moon. There's more to this than just the crackpot angle. Forget the extremists. It's the wider angle I want to get at. Go to the source. Yeah, yeah I'll knock it around. Uh, before you go, you don't happen to want Kathy's phone number. Uh, Regent 70493. We're having dinner. I always like to go right to the source. <laughs> you, Phil. Telephone. Okay. He'll be right here, Kathy. I wish you could get him to take you out to dinner again. He's not fit to live with. Still no angle for his series? Well, he keeps working, but here he comes. You stop conspiring. Hi. Hi. You sound like an unhappy writer. Oh, I'm fine. Just wish I were dead, that's all. Nothing on paper, huh? Not a syllable. I'm in my stubborn streak. If it won't budge, I won't. Oh, I shouldn't have interrupted you. I've told you, if you don't call, I just keep wondering why, so it works out as an interruption either way. How many interruptions a day do you want? Mm, I'll thank you to call me five or six times. It's your fault I'm in this jam. <laughs> I'll remember that. Goodbye, Phil. Goodbye, Kathy. Phil, isn't it always tough at the start? Well, sure, it's always tough, but never like this. I've tried everything, Ma. Anti-Semitism in business, labor, professions, same old drool, statistics, protests. It's like beating your head against a con... Ma, Ma, what's the matter? I, I don't know. I, I feel so bad. I feel... Phil. Serious, Doctor. There's nothing at all to worry about, Mr. Green. People with hearts outlive everyone else if they take care. Just keep your mother in bed for a few days. Well. Go on in. I know the way out. I'll stop by tomorrow. Thank you. Everything okay, Ma? Stop looking like Hamlet. I feel wonderful. Where's Tommy? Oh, I sent him down to the drugstore. Oh, poor little kid. I must have scared him to death. Well, what do you think you did to me? Phil, haven't you had enough for one day? Please don't try to work anymore. Oh, I'm through trying. As a matter of fact, I've decided to phone Minifee. There's a certain virtue in knowing when you're licked, Ma. Why are you licked? Just can't find the angle. I just can't write that series. But you got the angle before. Every article you ever wrote, the right angles got in somehow. Oh, I didn't beat my brains out looking for them. When I wanted to find out about a scared guy in a jalopy, 
I bought some old clothes and a broken down car and took Route 66 myself. I lived with the Okies, ate what they ate. I found the answers in my own guts, not somebody else's. Yes, Phil, that's right. I was an Okie. See, that's the difference, Ma. And the coal mine series. I worked in a mine, slept in a shack. I didn't try to dig into a coal miner's heart. I was a miner, and that's why I... Ma, oh, maybe... Hey, maybe I got it. The angle, Ma. Why, it's the only way. What's the only way? I, I, I'll be Jewish. I'll... All I got to do is say it. Nobody knows me around here. I can, I can just say it. I can live it myself for six weeks, six months, however long it takes. Ma, it's right this time. It's a cinch. It's the best medicine I could have. Look, look, will you keep my secret if you meet anybody? It has to be without exception if it's going to work at all. Well, if you're Jewish, I'm Jewish too, I guess. Why, well, I'll even... Uh, I got a phone right away. Well, why don't you ask Kathy to come over here? How'd you know I wasn't going to phone Minifee? Dope. Nobody phones an editor with that look on his face. It's beautiful, Phil. Now, tell me about your mother. Oh, she's much better. She's sleeping. Let's have a drink. No, thanks. Just some sherry. You're still not telling me angle. You sounded so excited on the phone. <laughs> it's funny. I thought I'd spill it the minute you got inside the door. Oh, it must be really something to get you like this. Oh, they'll be stumbling blocks, but I don't care. I'll lick them. I'll lick them when I get to them. I... You... You really don't want any sherry, do you? No. Neither do I. Kathy... Oh, Kathy. Phil, I... Don't... Don't say anything. Just let me kiss you. Phil, please. Kathy? I, I'm... I'm just trying to think. Well, marriage can be such a good way to live, Kathy. All these years I've been hoping. I've kept hoping, too, but... When you've made a mistake once, like I so have... You're not afraid. You're not sorry. About Tommy, I mean? Oh, Phil, I'm glad. It's... It's almost as if my marriage hadn't been wasted... As if I'd had a son growing up for me. No, darling, I'm not afraid. I knew you'd find an angle, Phil. Well, when do you start? Oh, what's wrong with right now? I'll get you an office on the secretary. Oh, about the secretary. She'd have to know, wouldn't she? Well, why would she have to know? As far as she's concerned, I'm Jewish. Of course. Now, what about lunch? Chance to meet some of the staff. And Irving Weissman is lunching with us. Might be good for you to know him. Who's the big industrialist, isn't he? Yes, come on. You'll like him a lot. Sorry we're late, boys. Huh? Sorry, Irving. This is Phil Green. Irving Weissman. Mr. Weissman. Mr. Green. Lou Jordan, our personnel manager. Oh, yeah. Joe oh, Tingler, our photographer. Oh, yeah. oh. Bert McEnoy, your layout. Oh, yeah. And last, as a kind of dessert, Phil, this is Ann Detry, our fashion editor. She eats men alive. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, you can sit next to her. Thank you again. Well, boys, Mr. Green is going to do a series for us on anti-Semitism. Oh, oh, really, John? Another one? No, Irving, not just another one. We're going to split it wide open. As an old friend, I think it's a very bad idea. Why? Because it'll only stir it up more. I'd say let us handle the problem our own way. The hush-hush way? Just let it alone. We know from bitter experience the less talk there is about it, the better. Sure, pretend it doesn't exist. Keep silent and let the rabble-rousers do all the talking. No, sir. We're going to call a spade a spade, and I think it's high time and a fine idea. And so do I. I you sound pretty hot about it, Mr. Green. Well, I feel pretty hot about it. Huh? And I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that I'm Jewish myself. Hey, waiter, waiter. How about some service here? Nice going, Phil. <laughs> I'm your secretary, Mr. Green, Elaine Wales. May I come in? Oh, how do you do? Well, the first thing I want to do is write a lot of letters. They'll go to clubs, resorts, interviews for jobs, apartments for lease, applications to medical schools. Got a whole list here somewhere. Yes, sir. I'll write each letter on blank stationery and send two to each address. Two? Yes, one of them I'll sign Skylar Green and the other Philip Greenberg. See what I mean? Greenberg? Just so there'll be no doubt about it. I changed my name, Mr. Green. Did you? No, Green's always been my name. What was yours? Wolofsky. Estelle Wolofsky, and I just couldn't take it. So I did exactly what you're doing. I wrote the same firm two letters. I sent the Elaine Wales one after they said there were no openings to Estelle Wolofsky. I got the job, all right. You know what firm that was? This firm, Smith's Weekly. No. The great liberal magazine that fights injustice. 
Oh, it slays me. Mr. Minifee know about this? Oh, no. That's Mr. Jordan's department, personnel. Oh, is this the list I'm to write to? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Now, if you'll get your book, I'll start dictating those letters. Well, Doctor, how's my mother? Your mother can be up and about tomorrow, Mr. Green. Oh, that's fine, fine. Oh, uh, would you mind if I had her see a good internist doctor just to be on the safe side? Oh, not at all. I'd suggest you take her to Mason Van Wyck. Well, one of my friends recommended a Dr. Abrams. Abrams? Yes, Jacob Abrams, Mount Sinai Hospital. Isn't he any good? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Completely reliable, not given to overcharging the way some do. You mean the way some doctors do or the way some Jewish doctors do? I suppose some of us do it, too, not just the chosen people. Well, Abrams doesn't impress me. I'll try Dr. Van Wyck. I've no special loyalty to Jewish doctors simply because I'm Jewish myself. No, no, of course not. Well, uh, uh, good evening, Mr. Green. some restaurants, you'll just have to resign yourself to my cooking. Kathy, I'm delighted. So sit down. It's all just a trap. I want you to talk. Oh, talk, huh? But not a bite to eat until you tell me your angle. Darling, do you realize I still don't know? Phil, tell me. Well, it's, it's really very simple. I'm just going to let everybody know that I'm Jewish, that's all. Jewish? But you're not Phil, are you? Well, not that it would make any difference to me, but you said I'm going to let everybody know, as if you hadn't before and would now. So I just wondered. Oh, Phil, you're annoyed with me. No, I... I was just thinking. Well, it's just that you caught me off guard. You don't think too much of the angle, do you? Oh, I do, darling. It's, uh, well, it's just that... Well, I think it'll mix everybody up. Uh, People won't know what you are. Of course, after the series, they'll know. But even so, it'll... It'll keep cropping up, won't it? All right, let it crop up. Oh, I must be out of my head. Let it is right. Who cares? Now, tell me some more. Well, to begin with, you have to promise not to give me away. But really, no exceptions, okay? Okay. What about the people at the magazine? Won't they talk? They're not in on it. Only Mr. Minifee. The rest all think you're Jewish? Look, Kathy, if this thing is going to work, the only chance is to go whole hog at it. Of course. I hadn't really seen it before. I... I didn't mean to be so sharp just now. I'm sorry. Dinner? Fine. I can eat some more coffee. Oh, thanks. I... Well, I really think I'd better be getting along. So soon? I'll want to look in on Ma before she gets to sleep. Oh, of course. It was a mighty fine dinner, Kathy. I'll call you tomorrow sometime. All right. Good night, Kathy. Oh, uh... Just... Just buzz for the elevator. Good night, Phil. What? Oh, oh. No, no thanks. Didn't you ring? Yes, but I forgot something. Kathy. Oh, darling. Darling, what are we doing? What are we doing to each other? I, I couldn't go away, not like that. It's, it's my fault, Kathy. I'm always weighing and judging. I'm such a solemn fool. Oh, but I, I should have said your idea was fine right away. It is, darling. It's wonderful. I don't know what happened. I, I felt insulted, and I... I couldn't let you off. I couldn't make it any easier for you. Oh, and all through dinner, I kept trying to reach you, to tell you I was sorry, and I couldn't. I wanted you so to come back. Oh, I did come back, darling. Please, please let me come back always. Our stars will return with Act Two of Gentleman's Agreement in a moment. Say, Libby, have you turned political reporter? What's all this talk about Washington, D.C.? Oh, the lighter side of the Washington scene. 
Universal International has released a very timely and amusing story about a switchboard operator in the White House. What? No intrigue? Uh, yes, but on the romantic side. In the picture called For the Love of Mary. Who plays Mary? Deanna Durbin. Oh? And she fairly sparkles in the role. Her singing voice is lovelier than ever. Who uh, is the lucky man? Well, I won't tell you that. But Edmund O'Brien, Don Taylor, and Jeffrey Lynn all vie with each other. I'd make a date with a telephone voice like Deanna's <laughs> anytime. Well, she looks just as lovely as she sounds. And yet her costumes in For the Love of Mary are typical of what the average girl can afford. Perfect grooming and fresh accessories turn the trick. But that was no trick at all for the studio. They let Lux Flakes take care of everything washable. Isn't that what most smart girls do, too? Of course. And the new tiny diamonds of Lux make it easier than ever. They're so fast, they suds up in a jiffy. And so rich, they last and last. What they do for nice things is really something. Why, even sheer nylons last twice as long. A smart economy. Washing stockings with a strong soap or rubbing with cake soap can easily wreck a budget. That kind of treatment makes stockings run much more quickly. And then stocking bills run way out of bounds. Those new tiny diamonds of Lux actually cut down stocking bills. Tests prove they make stockings last twice as long. And that's just like getting an extra pair every time you buy a pair. Back now to our producer, Mr. Keeley. Here's the second act of Gentleman's Agreement, starring Gregory Peck as Phil and Ann Baxter as Kathy. <laughs> A few days have gone by, and Philip Green, posing as a Jew, is finding it a simple matter to get the evidence he's looking for. Sorry about those notes tomorrow, Miss Wales. It's pretty late. Mr. Green, uh, is it true about Mr. Minifee? I mean, about that ad he's running in the newspapers, Help Wanted Secretaries? It's true, all right. You, uh, you told him about me? Well, yes, I did. From now on, every Help Wanted ad will contain one sentence in big type. Religion is a matter of indifference to this office. He was rather an angry man, Miss Wales. But, Mr. Green, I... Well, you don't want things changed around here, do you? I mean, well, just let them get one wrong one in here, and, well, it's no fun being the fall guy for the kikey ones. Now, look, Miss Wales. Words like yid and kike and nigger and coon make me kind of sick, no matter who says them. Well, I only said it for a type. What do you mean by type? Well, loud, too much rouge. I think you're sort of heckling me, Mr. Green. You know as well as I do the sort that starts trouble, and the sort that doesn't, like you and me. Oh, you mean because we don't look especially Jewish? Because we're okay Jews? Because with us it can be nice and comfortable and quiet? I didn't say that. I hate anti-Semitism, Miss Wales, and I hate it when it comes from you just as much as I hate it from a Gentile. Me? Why, Mr. Green? I'll see you tomorrow, Miss Wales. I'm going home. Hi there. Oh, hello, Miss Detry. How can you stride down the hall with such energy at the end of the day? I'm bushed. By the way, assuming I'm my vital young self again by tomorrow night, I'm giving a party. Will you come? Oh, thanks. I'd like to. Can I bring my girl? Sure, you can bring your girl. How's the series coming? It's coming. Good. Just don't let it interfere with tomorrow night. Well, darling, did you like it? Anne's party? Mm-hmm. Well, I like this best of all. I got you alone now. You don't have to rush home, do you, Phil? Uh, what about Anne? Do you like Anne? <laughs> I hate her. She's much too fond of you. <laughs> Jealous? Wonderful. Oh, darling, I've got some good news for you. We're going to another party. I telephoned my sister from Anne. Oh, Phil, Jane's aching to meet you, and they're giving this big party for us on Saturday. Fine. Um, Phil, won't we have to let Jane and Harry in on it? I mean about you. But, Kathy, if I'm going to keep it a secret, I... be that inflexible... Darling, don't be angry, but I did tell Jane. Oh. Well, what'd she say? Well, she thought it was the cleverest way in the world to do research. Oh, you love her, and Harry, too. You made them promise not to say anything. I wouldn't tell them till they had. All Jane asked was that you skip the whole thing for the party, and, and I said... You said no. You said he won't skip the whole thing for the party. No. No, I didn't. I said I'd ask you. You mean you think I should? Oh, darling, why do you always lose your sense of proportion whenever the subject comes up? 
You know those suburban groups, Connecticut and Claremont. Well, it would, it would just start a whole mess for Jane and Harry. And for nothing. And if it were a mess for something? But, Phil, you're not Jewish. It would just ruin the party for Jane. Why can't I make you see that? I, I know, I promise, no exceptions. But it just seems so silly to start a thing for her up there when it's not true. Well, why not tell Jane just to call the party off? Phil, no. Besides, if you were to use my house up there next summer... Your house? Yes. It's not far from Jane's, dear. It'll be our house, and... Well, it would just make a... A thing. A mess. An inconvenience. Well, it would. For Jane and her husband, or for you, too? I'd be so tensed up, I wouldn't have any fun either. Oh, Phil... If everything's going to be so edgy and solemn, I... I think I'd better go now. Good night, Kathy. Phil! Telephone, Phil! Oh, if it's Kathy, Ma, tell Phil, her. it's Dave. Dave Goldman. Dave? I thought he was in Europe. Where is he, Ma? Give me that phone. Hello. Hey, don't you ever get up in the morning? Dave, oh, this is wonderful. Where are you? LaGuardia Airport. I just got in. I haven't had breakfast. Well, grab a cab and get right over here. Same address as in my letter, okay? Oh, you bet it's okay. I'll be right there. Wonderful. Yackety, yackety, yackety. Phil, for heaven's sake, let the poor fellow eat his breakfast. He's had breakfast every day, but I haven't seen him for four years. Oh, it's <laughs> wonderful, Dave. I mean what you said about bringing Carol and the kids to New York. What will you do, Dave? I mean when you get out of the Army. You got a job lined up? A big job. Eastern representative of the firm. It's, it's the best break I ever had. It all depends, of course, if I can find a place to live. I'm going to spend my whole term in the leave just concentrating on getting a place big enough for us. Uh, we'll find something if we have to dynamite. Meanwhile, you'll stay here. Oh, now, wait a minute. And no arguments. You're talking to a civilian. Uh, well, boys, don't <laughs> settle all the problems today. Save a couple for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, am I glad to see you, Phil. And the old lady. What a gal. Uh, come on now, give. Give? This series you're doing, what's it all about? Oh, no, oh, we'll get around to it later. What's eating you, Phil? You're expecting a call? You keep looking at the phone. <laughs> Is that obvious, huh? Oh, I... I had a scrap with my girl. I guess I want her to be the one to phone. As far as the series goes, well, I'm doing some work on anti-Semitism with a special angle. That's interesting. Oh, fine. It's interesting. Phil, it's just that... Well, I'm on the sidelines in anti-Semitism. It's your fight, brother. Okay. I get it. Listen, I, I don't care about the Jews as Jews. Sure, they're my people, but I don't care. It's the whole thing, not just the, the poor, poor Jews. Well, what's this special angle you've got? Well, I'm, I'm saying that I'm Jewish, and it works. Why, oh, you fool. And it's working? Too well, having my nose rubbed in it. Yeah, I can guess. You're not insulated. You mean you can get indifferent to it? No. You're telescoping a lifetime problem into what, a, a few weeks? It just concentrates it, makes it hurt more. Now, uh, now what about your girl? Oh, just one of those things, I guess. I'm probably wiser staying on my own. After six years, you lose the instinct for marriage. Oh, baloney. Go on and call her, you big dope. Say so you're right and she's wrong, so what? <laughs> Okay, maybe I will. And wish me luck. I'm off to start house hunting. Hey, look, call me at the office at 5.30. I'll phone Kathy, and, and I'll get a hold of Ann Deppery. She's a girl who works in the office. We'll have a big celebration dinner. Okay. Say, can you imagine what it's going to be like being married again, and you and Carol here, all of us together again? How about that, huh? Well, first I've got to get a roof over Carol's head. I'll call you, Phil, 5.30. Kathy, Phil. What happened? I don't know. I couldn't reach her, but I left word for her to call me here if she gets back. You having fun? More fun than you can shake a stick at. Well, I'll send the waiter out for a stick just for a test. <laughs> oh, no thanks, Dave. None of those things ever worked for me. Once I tried letting a smile being my umbrella, I got awful wet. <laughs> Another time I kept a stiff upper lip for about a week and people just thought I was having my face lifted. <laughs> Tell me something, gentlemen. Tell me why it is that every man who seems attractive these days is either married or barred on a technicality. Well, your timing's rotten, but your instincts are just great. <laughs> oh. Well, here's to my instincts. Oh, pardon me. Oh, pardon me. Can you get through? I think so. Suppose I can get through, too. <laughs> they sure crowd in these tables, don't they? Yeah. Oh, an officer, huh? A captain. You know, I don't like officers. <laughs> well, neither do I. I don't blame you. What's your name, bud? Dave. Dave Goldman, what's yours? Frank, come on. Goldman, huh? 
I especially don't like officers if they're yet. Hey, Frank, what the devil's the matter with you? I'm sorry, Captain. He's terrible when he gets tanked up. Come on, let's take a walk. All right, sit down, Phil. Take it easy. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Captain. I hope you won't hold it against our restaurant, sir. Forget it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Green? Yes? Telephone call, sir. A lady. Oh, thanks. Excuse me. Well, well, Ann, don't just look at me. Let's see. But where are you, Kathy? I'm up at my sister's, Phil, at Jane's. I came up to have it off with her. I couldn't call you till I fixed everything up. And, darling, I was wonderful. I said all the things you would have wanted me to say. Oh, Phil, why can't I make myself clear to Jane and Harry when it's you I want to be clear with? Because I'm so hard to get along with, baby. Like I told you, I can be such a solemn fool. Well, the party's tomorrow. Take the 3 o'clock train, I'll meet you at the station. Oh, darling, I can breathe again. I wish it were tomorrow. So do I. I love you, Kathy. I love you, Phil, more than ever. Oh, there you are. Darling. About Phil. He's simply wonderful. Oh, I knew you'd like him, Jane. But where is he? He's in the house, surrounded. <laughs> Say, can he charm them? Well, do you like the party? It's just like I'd hoped it would be. Incidentally, aren't the Baskins coming? Oh, didn't I tell you, dear? Joe called. He's got that awful arthritis again. Well, what about the Howards and the Burlicks? Oh, they make me so mad. At the very last minute, they decided to go to Hot Springs. I, uh, I thought I'd mentioned it. Jane, look, I'm in this thing just as deeply as Phil. Well, darling, what do you mean? You know what I mean. The guests, our friends. You made sure, didn't you, that just the safe ones would be here. Kathy, you're mad. Well, maybe I am. I'm going in and get Phil. Kathy! Don't be alarmed, darling. I just want to take him over to see the cottage. I want him to see it before it gets dark. They're wonderful people, Kathy. See, I feel pretty much of a fool. I mean, over the fuss I kicked up beforehand. You're sure they aren't just trying to be nice, Phil? Of course I'm sure. They all asked me about the series. Thought it was fine. Not one lifted eyebrow in the bunch. Well, darling, here it is. The house. It's lovely, Kathy. Hey, aren't you supposed to carry me across the threshold or something? <laughs> That's only if you refuse to marry me. In which case, I just throw you in. Well... You did all this by yourself? Every bit of it. Phil, about Tommy. Will he like it here? Tom? He'll be crazy about it. Did you live here long, Kathy? I never lived here. Why not? Well, it's hard to explain. I love this house deeply, Phil. I started to build it when things first began to go wrong between Bill and me. I poured all my hopes into this place. And when it was finished, I, I knew I couldn't live here with someone I didn't really love. But after the divorce? No. No, I just stay at Jane's and come here just to poke at the curtains and sit a while. But now, oh, Phil, you and I are going to be so happy here. This house and I, we were waiting for you. I was always waiting for you, I think. Kathy. Kathy, you're sure? You're really sure? Oh, darling. Then why can't we get married now? Oh, I want to, Phil. But could we make it just a little longer? I have a job, you know. I, I should give them some notice. Two weeks, dear. Is that too long? That's much too long. Can you imagine it, Anne? Kathy giving up this apartment just because she's marrying the guy? Well, you're still looking for an apartment, Dave. Why don't you take it over? Well, that's what I said. Only he needs three bedrooms. Well, if we're going to the theater... Well, loads of time. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him, Anne. Like an old married couple and two days before the wedding. Incidentally, where's the honeymoon taking place? Or is it a secret? Oh, a big secret. We're going to the White Mountains. Flew in, do you know it? Flew in. You're kidding. <laughs> What's the matter with the flume in? Well, it's restricted, that's all. Restricted? No Jews, huh? Oh, darling, I'm sorry. I didn't realize when I sent the wire. It's all right, baby. It's not your fault. Anne, are you sure? Of course I'm sure. But they confirmed the reservations. I'm not going to let them off the hook. Darling, we can go to the cottage. We won't even tell Jane we're there. Oh, sure, sure. We can always go somewhere, but I... I'll get it. Those nasty little snobs aren't worth spreading over. There must be something to do besides accepting this. Hello? Oh, yes, oh you can't pin them down, Phil. They, they never what? say it straight out or put it in writing. They just worm out of it one way or another. Phil? Phil, it's Tom. He sounds frightened. Tom? Hello, Tom. What's up? 
Tom, listen. Her medicine's in the cabinet. I'll be there in five minutes. What happened? I don't know. It's Ma. Another attack, I guess. Well, I'll get a cab. Phil, wait. I'm going with you. Darling, cheer up. Your mother's much better this morning, and postponing a wedding isn't the worst thing in the world. No, I suppose it isn't. Just a week. Two at the most, Abram said. Well, I, uh, I might as well break the news. I won't be here for the wedding. Dad. What are you talking about? I can't abandon my family forever, and I can't find a place to live, so I'm late. Yeah, but that means your job, your whole future. I'll live. I did, Bill. I, uh, I phoned Carol. I told her I'd give it one day more, but I know there isn't a... Oh, Phil, what's the matter with you? I'm going up to Flume Inn. Phil. Phil, what for? Well, you're wasting your time, pal. Must be a time once when you fight back. I want to make them look me in the eye and then do it. I want the satisfaction. I can't explain it, but I want to do it for myself. But, Phil, people like that who restrict a place, they're nothing more. Well, let him do it, Kathy. You have to face them once. I did it once at Monterey. Well, they're more than nasty little snobs, Kathy. You can call them that and dismiss them. It's too easy. They're persistent little traitors to everything this country stands for, and you have to fight them. Not just for the poor, poor Jews, as Dave says, but for... Well, anyway, I'm going. Phil, please. I'll be back late this afternoon. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Present Act Three of Gentlemen's Agreement in a moment. Our guest tonight, Colleen Townsend, is a native Californian, but Colleen's photographs have been seen from coast to coast in magazines. What have you been doing at 20th Century Fox lately, Colleen? Well, practically reliving my college career, Mr. Keeley. You know, the campus scenes for Jeannie Crane's new picture, Apartment for Peggy, they're so realistic. Well, I hope you didn't have all the trouble Jean did. No. But I'm sure thousands of young married couples will sympathize with Bill Holden. You know, he's a veteran returning to college. The scenes with Jean in the hospital are particularly touching. Oh, yes. And didn't she look sweet when Edmund Gwen and Bill came to visit her? You know, she had taken her own bed jacket with her so she'd look especially pretty for all the visitors. Well, some fans will call that pretty soft, lying in bed all day. <laughs> it does sound easy, doesn't it? But I know that those scenes for Apartment for Peggy were shot over and over. And every morning, Jeannie's bed jackets and nighties were just as fresh and lovely as ever. But that's no surprise to John Kennedy. What does surprise people, Colleen, is that Lux flakes could be improved. And yet, the new tiny diamonds of Lux are more wonderful than ever. They're so sheer, they burst into suds at the touch of water. And they're richer. The suds last and last. I'm crazy about those new Lux diamonds. They certainly leave colors lovely. That's why it's foolish to risk wrong washing methods. They soon fade colors. But Lux Care keeps colors lovely three times as long. And that's just like getting three pretty slips for the price of one. Thank you for coming tonight, Colleen Townsend. Here's our producer, William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Gentleman's Agreement, starring Gregory Peck as Phil and Ann Baxter as Kathy. <laughs> A few hours later, at the exclusive Flume Inn, Phil Green presents himself at the registration desk. I have reservations for a double room and bath today through Thursday. What name, please? Uh, Green. Philip Green. Oh, yes, Mr. Green. A boy? Mr. Green's luggage. Uh, just one thing. Yes, sir? Is this hotel restricted? Well, uh, I'd hardly say it was restricted. Oh, then it's not restricted. Well, um... As a matter of fact... Uh, Mr. Uh, Adams, uh, perhaps I can help Mr. Green. I'm the manager, Mr. Green. Oh, good. In answer to your question, uh, may I inquire, are you, uh, that is, uh, do you follow the Hebrew religion yourself, or uh, you just want to make sure? Oh, I asked a simple question. I'd like to have a simple answer. Oh, well, you see, we have a very high-class clientele, and, well, naturally... Well, then you do restrict your guests to Gentiles. Well, I wouldn't say that, Mr. Green. 
But uh, in any event, there seems to be some mistake because we don't have an available room in the entire hotel. I could fix you up at the Brewster Hotel. I'm not staying it. at the Brewster. Look, I'm Jewish and you don't take Jews. That's it, isn't it? I never said that. If you don't accept Jews, say so. Don't you raise your voice to me, Mr. Green. You speak a little more quietly. Well, do you or don't you? Yes, Mr. McElroy. Please remove that luggage at once. Good day, Mr. Green. <laughs> Phil. Oh, I'm so glad you're back, darling. I thought maybe you'd phone. I guess I should have. How's Ma, Kathy? Fine. She's sleeping. Tommy's out playing. It was bad, wasn't it? I can tell by your face. Well, Dave was right. It was a waste of time. Where is Dave? With Ann. He wanted one last night on the town. I've just been thinking about Dave. And about the cottage, Phil? That Dave and his family could live there? Yes. I thought of it, too. You must know that. But it wouldn't work. Why not? Well, it would be just too uncomfortable for Dave in one of those neighborhoods. One of those neighborhoods. It's detestable, but that's the way it is. It's even worse in New Jordan. There, nobody can sell or rent to a Jew. And even in Claremont, where Jane's house is and my house is. There's a sort of gentleman's agreement that... Gentleman's... Kathy, you can't. Oh, I see. Just give in. Play along. Let their idiotic rules stand. But what can one person do? You can tell them to go jump in the lake. What can they do? Plenty. They can ostracize Dave. Some of the markets not deliver food. Not even wait on him. You expect us to live in that cottage now that I know this? Face facts, Phil. You know I'm on Dave's side. Well, I'm not on Dave's side or on any side except against their side. Kathy, do you or don't you believe in this? Because if you... Hi, Pop. Tom, do you mind? Kathy and I are talking. But, Pop, I... Tom. Tom, what's the matter? They call me a dirty Jew and a dirty kike, and they all ran oh, off. Oh, darling, it's not true. It's not true. You're no more Jewish than I am. It's just a horrible mistake. Kathy! Tom, you come with me. We'll talk about it in here. Now, take it easy, son. Take it easy. Glass of water? Thanks, Pop. How did it happen? I, I don't know. They said no dirty little Jew could play with them. Then they ran away. Why, Pop? Why? Tom... Did you want to tell them that you really weren't Jewish? No. That's good. You see, there's a lot of kids just like you who are Jewish. And if you said it, it would be sort of admitting that there was something bad in being Jewish and something swell in not. They wouldn't even fight. They just ran away. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of grown-ups just like that, too. Feel better? I'm okay, Pop. Atta boy. Look, you go read or something while I talk to Kathy. Okay. And, uh... Let's keep this to ourselves till Grandma's well, huh? Okay. Hi, Kathy. Hello, Tommy. Phil? Well? I have something to tell you. I'm pretty tired of feeling wrong. Everything I do or say is wrong about anything Jewish. All I did just now was to face facts about Dave. And for you to tell Tom what you just told and him... And what did you tell him? That he's the most wonderful of all creatures, a white, non-Jewish American instantly gave him that lovely taste of superiority, the poison that millions of parents drop into the minds of millions of children. You really think I'm an anti-Semite? No, Kathy, I don't. You do? You've thought it for a long time. No, it's just that I've come to see that lots of nice people who aren't, people who despise and deplore it, help it along and then wonder why it grows. That's the biggest discovery I've made about this whole business, the good people, the nice people. Oh, I hate it. I hate everything about this horrible thing. They always make trouble for everybody, even their friends. They force people to take sides against Stop them. Stop it, Kathy. They didn't suggest this series. They didn't give me the angle. They haven't a single thing to do with what's happened between you and me. Don't shout at me. And don't treat me to any more lessons in tolerance. I'm sick of it. I'm not going to marry into hot head shoutings and nerves. And you might as well know it now. Kathy, please. I, I'm sorry I shouted. I hate it when I do. It's not just the shouting, Phil. Now I know why I drew back when you first mentioned the angle. But you are what you are for the one life you have. You can't help it if you were born Gentile instead of Jew. It doesn't mean you're glad about it. But I'm glad. It'd be terrible. I'm glad I'm not. But I could never make you understand that. That it's a fact. Like being glad you're good-looking instead of ugly. Rich instead of poor. Well instead of sick. I hate you for doing this, Phil. We could have been so happy. We had so much to enjoy, so much to share. I hate you for taking it away from both of us.
typing, Miss Wales. Here, first three installments. Send every ten pages downstairs to Mr. Minifee. Now, oh, what's the matter? Well, the title of the series, I... I was Jewish for six weeks. Well, Mr. Green, you're a Gentile. But I never... Oh, what's so upsetting about that? You mean there's some difference between Jews and Gentiles? Mr. Green. Look at me. Same man I was yesterday. That's true, isn't it? You just can't believe that anybody would give up the glory of being non-Jewish for even six weeks, can you? And if I tell you that that's anti-Semitism, the feeling that being Gentile is better than being Jewish, you're going to tell me that I'm heckling you or twisting your words around or that it, it's just... Facing facts, as someone else said to me. Look at me, Miss Wales. Same face, same eyes, same nose, same everything. Here, take my hand, feel it. Same flesh as yours, isn't Mr. it? Mr. Green, please. No different today than yesterday, Miss Wales. The only thing that's different is the word Gentile. Mr. Minifee should want me. I'll be at home. Hello. Phil? Anne, do you know what you've done to the office? Everybody's going crazy. A fine thing. Well, what about? Why, well, your articles, of course. Phil, they're tremendous. Minifee's proud as punch. Incidentally, I am, too. Oh, thanks. But shame on you all the same for fooling me. About not being Jewish, I mean. Phil, do you feel like talking? Oh, not much, Anne. Well, just one thing. You and Kathy, it, it's over, isn't it? I guess it is. Look, if you're free tonight, come over to my place, will you? Okay. Thanks. For dinner, Phil? Just you and I. You know, you're quite a girl, Anne. I don't think I ever told you that before. Me? Sure. Everybody loves Anne. Only there's something on your mind that you're afraid to talk about. Come on, Anne. All right. Let's clear the air. Do you mind if I say something about you and Kathy? Let's don't. Be a little gentleman, then. Only this sort of nobility makes me sick. It's just that I think you're pretty straight and she... Drop it, Anne. Okay, I'm a cat and this is dirty pool. But I'm intolerant of hypocrites. Kathy would rather let Dave lose that job than risk a fuss up there in Claremont. That's it, isn't it? She's afraid. The Cathys everywhere are afraid of getting the gate from their little groups of nice people. But they want you and Uncle John to stand up and yell and take sides and fight. But do they fight? Oh, no. They scold the rabble-rousers twice a year and think they fought the good fight for democracy. But they haven't got the guts to take the step from talking to action. One little action on one little front. Oh. Phil, do you hate me for saying this? No, I don't hate anybody. Well, I'd like to say one more thing. If two people are right for each other, they usually discover it in time. And if I had a kid I loved, I'd want him to be brought up with people who felt the way I did about the basic thing. You're proposing, Anne? Maybe. Maybe I am. Kathy, I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, Dave, thanks for coming. I had a little trouble finding this restaurant, but I'm here. I know. I know you've got a train to catch. I won't keep you long. You know about Phil and me. Yeah. Dave, I want an honest answer. Do you think I'm anti-Semitic? No, Kathy, I don't. Phil does. Does he? You know I'm not anti-Semitic. You're a Jew and you know it. Why can't I make it clear to everyone but Phil? Why? I wish I knew. I hate this thing just as much as he does. Why can't he see it? Why, last night at dinner, a man told a vicious little story. I was, I was ill. I was sick with rage and shame. Well, what and... kind of a story, Kathy? Oh, it was just a story. He tried to get laughs with words like kike and coon. I despised him and everybody else at the table. What did you do, Kathy? What do you mean? What did you say when he finished? I wanted to yell at him. At everyone. Why do we sit here and take it when he's attacking everything we believe in? Why don't we call him on it? And what did you do? I felt ashamed. Ashamed and sick. I still do. I wonder if you'd feel sick if you'd nailed him, Kathy. 
You know, there's a funny kind of elation about socking back. I learned that a long time ago. Phil's learned it, too. And I haven't. Well, lots of things are pretty rough, Kathy. This is just a, a different kind of war. And anybody who crawls away is, is just as much a quitter. Well, somebody told a story. A man at a dinner table. And the nice people didn't laugh. They even despised him for it. But they let it pass. Behind that joke is Flume in and Claremont and, and Tommy and the kids down the block. And if you don't stop with that joke... Where do you stop? Is that what you mean? Yes, that's what I mean. Where do you call the halt? I've been getting mad at Phil because he expected me to fight this. Instead of getting mad at the people who help it along. But Phil will fight. He'll always fight. And if I just sit by and feel sick, then I'm not a fit wife for him. It was always on those deeper issues that we had our quarrels. Always. And I never knew it till now. A man wants his wife to be more than a companion, Kathy. He wants a sidekick to go through the rough spots with him. And, well, she has to feel that the same things are the rough spots. Or they're always out of line with each other. Well, you're not cast in bronze, sweetie. You're nice and soft and pliable. You can do anything you want to do with yourself. Can I? Dave, are you sure? Tell me you're sure. Phil? Oh, Ma. You're home early. How's Ann? Ann's fine. Hey, what's the big idea? You're supposed to be in bed. Oh, don't scold, Phil. I couldn't sleep, so I sneaked into your room and stole the first installments. Phil. Phil, I want to kiss you. Thanks, Ma. I think... I'd rather have that than almost anything. I wish your father could have read this, Phil. He'd have liked it. He'd have liked this. And as I drove away from that inn, I knew all about every man or woman who'd been told that the job was filled when it wasn't. Every youngster who'd ever been turned down by a college or a summer camp. And I knew that they had somehow known it too. Those patient, stubborn men who argued and fought and came up with a constitution and a bill of rights. They knew that the tree is known by its fruit, and that injustice corrupts a tree, that its fruit shrivels and falls on that dark ground of history where other great hopes have rotted and died, where equality and freedom still remain the only choice for wholeness and soundness in a man or in a nation. Your father would have liked to have you say that, Phil. Not enough of us realize it, Ma. The time's getting short. You mean Kathy? No, not just Kathy. Lots of people. You know something, Phil? I suddenly want to live to be very old. I want to be around to see what happens five years, ten years from now. Even if it's only to see the start, the beginning of people finding out how to live together. Yes, I may stick around for quite a while yet. Dave? Hello. Oh, excuse me. I've got to make a phone call. Well, how do you feel, Ma? I've just decided I'm not going to die. I just decided something, too. Well, hello. Uh, Mr. Case? This is Dave Goldman. Uh, I'm sorry to call you at this late hour, but I can take that job. That's right. I've got a house. Uh, thanks. So am I. Dave, that's wonderful. Oh, it's Kathy's house, Ma, up there in Claremont. She's going to live all summer at her sister's. And if anybody dishes out anything, she'll be right there to dish it back. At least we... Hey, Phil. Phil, where are you going? Yes, sir. I think I'll stick around for a long time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Kathy... Kathy, could we... Is there a chance Don't I'm... Don't talk, darling. Just hold me, Phil. Just hold me.
Before our stars return for their curtain calls, Libby Collins has a shopping tip for homemakers. Have you ever had company to dinner and suddenly discovered you'd run short of teaspoons? Well, now you have a chance to buy extra teaspoons you'll be proud to use for any occasion and at a tremendous saving. Their original Rogers silver plate, made by the world's largest silversmiths. And you get three for only 50 cents with the opening tab from a box of Lux. That's a wonderful value. These are the same original Rogers silver plate teaspoons Lux offered before the war. They're the allure pattern that goes so well with other silver. With your spoons, you'll get an order blank so that you can order extra spoons and matching pieces. You'll love these spoons. To get your spoons, mail the opening tab from a box of Lux, together with 50 cents in coin and your name and address, to Lux, Wallingford, Connecticut. This offer is good only in the continental United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, and is subject to all state and local regulations. You can order as many spoons as you like. Just send 50 cents and the opening tab from a box of Lux for each set of three. Mail to Lux, Wallingford, Connecticut. We return you now to William Keeley. Our thanks to the stars who gave such distinguished performances here tonight. Here they are at the footlights, Gregory Peck and Ann Baxter. Greg, I hear you've been working the other side of the street this summer as a producer at the La Jolla Playhouse. Yes, I have, Bill. But I work for myself as an actor in one play, too. <laughs> That's a good safe time to talk back to the boss. <laughs> With no danger of an argument. The theater at La Jolla is a cooperative venture, isn't it, Greg? Well, yes, we open in the summer like the Straw Hat Theaters in the East. It gives a group of us a chance to take a postman's holiday. And what kind of a vacation did you have, Anne? Well, I spent most of it on horseback, Bill. Well, that sounds like a Western picture. <laughs> no, not a picture. John and I were visiting at the famous King Ranch in Texas. Oh, then Mr. and Mrs. Hodiak saw the largest ranch in the world. I understand it's somewhat larger than the state of Rhode Island. Well, Bill, it's so big that they have stations where guests can stay all night when they're traveling across the ranch. We rode for a week and saw only a part of it. That's a nice little farm they have there. <laughs> <laughs> have you picked a play for next week, Bill? Yes, Greg, it's the universal international hit, Tap Roots. And we'll have the same stars who are in the picture, Van Heflin and Susan Hayward. <laughs> Tap Roots is a love story set in the sweeping drama of the war between the states, a human story that's part of a superhuman conflict. It's a current picture and the kind our friends enjoy on the air. And you have two of my favorites in your cast. Good night. Good night. Good night. We hope to see both of you soon again. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Van Heflin and Susan Hayward in Taproots. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Gregory Peck has just finished the 20th Century Fox picture, Yellow Sky. Ann Baxter is currently seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, The Luck of the Irish, co-starring with Tyrone Power. Heard in our cast tonight were Janet Scott as Mrs. Green, Jeff Chandler as Dave, and Francis Robinson as Ann. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Van Heflin and Susan Hayward in Tap Roots. For lighter, finer, richer tasting cakes, Spry tops any other type shortening. Spry's amazing cake improver takes guesswork and hard work out of cake making. Try Spry's one bowl method for glorious cakes. For all you bake and fry, rely on Spry. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Tap Roots, starring Van Heflin and Susan Hayward. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.